Right. Are we ready? Let's do it. Yeah. Right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back on into the Blow Par podcast. This one's going to be a short clip uh, with our guest, Nick. Um, thank you again, Nick, for giving up some time and no giving us insight. Uh, today, uh, well, this episode, we're going to be talking about driving distance, how to drive like the tour pros, how to add distance, how to drive it more consistently, or whatever, whatever advice Nick has for us. Uh, yeah, and Nick's this experience is all the yeah, this is the fun one. This is the one that everyone wants to uh, wants to hear about. The one thing I will right. say as well is that Nick Popton is is very sneaky long. You sort of you yeah. stand up on a tee box, and I was explaining this to Joe earlier. There's been times where it's been into wind, and you just sort of hit it, and it's sort of like sixty yards past you, and you're like, oh, well, yeah. You always did. You always did spin it though, Joe. <laughs> oh, less now. <laughs> less now. You always did spin it. Joe will admit but, that. Well, yeah, if- I mean. It's uh, it's definitely a part of the game where if you can get it in the right place all the time, sort of getting your scoring opportunities going is is uh, you know you you put it in the right place in the fairways all the time or in the fairways you you're making life so much easier for yourself. It's a big part of the game and, and definitely uh, something that the, the general club golfer should really work quite quite hard on as well. Uh, to because that's I think where the most of them lose the shots really. At, you see a lot of three off the tees and sort of in really bad places, but sometimes sort of bad decisions can can creep in. Uh, I I always pick the picks for tip uh, off. Well, it was actually at Yorkshire coaching, but it's something Matt Fitzpatrick uses. Uh, he knows what his average carry is for the week, so in his yardage book, he would basically imagine his his average carry at that point was about two eighty. So he'd imagine alignment rod in the middle of the fairway at two eighty pick a point above that one of the trees and that's where he'd aim for the whole week because he knew that was his average carry yeah so he was yeah. never like oh the wind's off the right but the middle of the fairway to matt was at 280 but that was the point he would aim at obviously it's not anymore because he's got a lot longer this was sort of four or five years ago just before he was serving pro uh now he he probably carries it 300 easily he's a lot stronger a lot quicker uh but I found it was a really good point because the middle of the fairway gave him the biggest missy the missy the side. So actually, he was going to increase his percent of fairways hit by aiming at that point. Yeah. So he managed himself to get his consistency up just by, you know, managing where he was aiming every round. Yeah, and I guess that's that kind of links into that aim small, miss small kind of yeah, mindset as well. Yeah, definitely. Rather than being like, oh, the wind's off the right this time, I'll I'll hit it out the right and let it come back. It's like your biggest. You know, then you've got to hit it left, vice versa. Wind off a left, I'll aim it left. And then he was hitting it, aiming for the middle parts of the fairway every day. So he would always maximise his his mitts. And if you watch Matt hit balls with driver, he is uh, like a bullet. Hits it so straight, hits it long. People don't think he's long, but he's sneaky long. Such a flat, good ball flight. Uh, and you can see why he, when he's on, he just does not miss fairways. He's like a, a dart. I, I totally envy that. Uh, what, one thing for you. Now, um, I think everybody kind of gets that this is a really old hat saying, but just debunk it for me. Drive for show, putt for dough. Load of rubbish? Nowadays, load of rubbish. Probably was pretty valid back in the day, but I mean, now you, you've got to hit it good because, I mean, the emphasis on driving it is phenomenal now because if you... If you don't hit it over 280 through the air and then you decide to lay up behind that bunker, it, it, yeah, it, oh, it might be 60 yards, but it, it, it's 60 yards in an approach shot. And if it's 60 yards off the tee, it's also 10 yards in your irons as well. Yeah. Because he's going to be longer than you with your irons if he's longer than you with your driver. So if you lay up at the bunker and leave yourself 200 in, if he knocks it over those bunkers, he leaves himself 100 in. You can't compete to the tucked flags now. Yeah, no. you cannot physically compete, so you have to you have to drive it good to compete, and you're increasing your chances from 200 yards. You're not making birdie. No, absolutely. Pops, I was going to have a quick question on that as well. So let's say, for example, we play Amundwara tenth again on the foul, though. So you've got the yeah. stones. That was always quite common. Everyone would lay out short of the stones. Mm. Now, then, would you be looking to push over it? Like you'd be looking to try and land yeah. it on the downslope and get out, get across it just to yeah, 100 percent, Joe. I mean. Because if you don't pull that tee shot off, you leave yourself 220 in. 
I mean, I played the tournament round there and we played up the back, so it wasn't on to knock it over. Right. But if you were playing sort of off the front tee boxes, you 100% would take it on. I mean, 13, the par five down the hill, dog to the right uh, on Amandoira on the Faldo, you take that on now because you, right. you, you know, you're not taking it up the left hand side and thinking, well, it's a three shotter because. It, it isn't anymore. It has to be a two. It has to be a two shot or around the green, yeah. because you know someone's making eagle. So your mindset changes, and you, you you end up having to pump on a little bit off the tee. I remember the fourteenth. I took the fourteenth green on in tournament, uh, which is the one after the par five. Yeah, and there's a ravine at three hundred, and everyone's like, "What are you doing? What are you playing?" At? I'm like, "It's three hundred yards to the ravine. And it's downwind." And I don't, and I'm not going to miss with driver. I knocked it like 20 yards short of the green, and had a simple short game shot. When I'm watching people hit four iron off the tee, not quite hit it good, leave himself 150 in. Now, too far, isn't it? 20 yards versus 150. I reckon I'm I'm over 70, 80 percent chance I'm going to get it up and down from 20 yards. From 150, I reckon he's lower than 10 percent that he's going to get it up and down. And that's all because. I've ta- not taken a risk, but I've had confidence in my driving to take the shot on. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And there's one, there's my one thing. Massively. There's one thing that really, that really stands out to me through all the episodes that we've that we've recorded today that people will see um, probably mm. every couple of days. Lovery, that's what we're aiming for. Yeah, every couple of days. Um, is that there's there's one thing that's that shines through is that at the level that you're at, Nick. I mean, it's slightly different, I'd say, for me and Lovery. Like mm. if, we, if we were to go and play a PJ Pro Am, let's say different okay. venues as well, different golf courses that you play, you'll generally play golf courses where you might have 16, 15 chances in a round of yeah. golf if you play sort of good. You have three or four holes that are a bit brutal, but there might not be chances that day. When you play golf courses where there's six, seven chances in a round of golf, like good chances, you've got to make some of the ones that aren't good chances chances. So you've got to take something on eventually. Yeah. Because you're never going to birdie every one of those holes that are a chance. So you've got to sneak one or two here or there on the holes that are a bit brutal. Yeah, I mean, I think also what kind of Joe's getting at as well is, I mean, you've got to imagine, like, especially the course I'm at, for example, I mean, it's just over 6,000 yards. It's interesting yeah. because it, it plays longer. I'm, I'm not yeah. quite sure how it works. The layout forces you to have certain yards in, you know, quite severe dog legs where you do have to have 150 mm. or so in and it's quite interesting you know like my average round of golf now around there i'll probably only hit driver three times and that yeah. is like three times and then it, don't get me wrong you can be aggressive you can hit more drivers which if there was a tour event there the guys would do um and i think it's really interesting to see that difference where you know i'll stand there and hit three drivers around you would get tour guys there they probably hit more whereas i would look at it and think that's just not on the punishment's too severe Whereas for you guys that maybe hit a little bit straighter, you're going to actually go, well, that actually, that's on. Mm. Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, there's also the confidence in your ability that obviously the more you repeat doing something, the more you're going to want to take it on. If yeah. you've never been built that way, you've always been built, but someone told you that it's four iron to the corner and wedge on. They've never been told you, oh, it's driver over the corner and have a pot. But mm. uh, if you're trying to increase your scoring ability and you're trying to actually you know, from that 150-yard shot, actually, you're not getting, you're getting a very small percent of them up and down. So over a law of average, over a four-round tournament, if you get, you know, one out of the four-round tournament up and down, you've done well there from 150. And then you probably play the hole in one or two under maybe, at best, if you really get it hot uh, from the corner. Whereas if you take it on, you can genuinely play the hole in four under and not really break much of a sweat. No. And the just, potential for scoring just goes through the roof by actually taking on a shot that, you know, is a bit aggressive, don't get me wrong, but you're, it's aggressive off the tee, not aggressive with your second shot. And I think sometimes yeah. you have to understand that being aggressive with the first shot sometimes gives you a chance of still making par if it doesn't come off. Whereas if you're defensive with your first shot, sometimes you can end up making bogey. And it being yeah. a really sort of bad bogey. That's yeah. true. I mean, yeah. the, the interesting thing is, certainly with the course I'm at at the moment, like the reason why I guess I'm laying back with three wood or two iron, for example, um, a lot of the time you have hazards that are right or left, a lot of sort of out of bounds. Um, yeah. 
you know, and they are places that, in fairness, if you were offline, you, you're going to make a bogey, or you know, unless you get up and down. And for me, from those distances, yeah. a lot of time I'm not getting up and down. Um, so I've had to be really honest with my own game and go, well, actually, for me to shoot better scores, I've actually got to rein it in off the tee there, and then rely yeah. on making more pars and the off birdie. But I guess that's that is my ability at the moment to do that. So for people listening to this, they've got to apply it, as you say. Yeah, it's all perspective, isn't it, to that to an individual's game. Some some people aren't very good off the tee, and and realistically, a ball in play is great. Uh, and the, uh, but there are times when you have to sort of take those shots on, and and Definitely. like we say, sometimes closer to the green is better because it yeah. means, you know a hundred yards out of the rough is a lot better than 150, 160 out of the fairway. Absolutely. Not to fear taking those shots on. And if you can get it to 100 yards in the rough, that's great. If that's not in your ability, then, you know, 150 in the fairway is, is perfect. You know, that, that's the next best thing. And that, that's sort of playing within your own game and, and understanding when to attack and, and defend. Mm. So let's say, for example, then I'm Mr. 14 handicapper. I'm sort of Mr. Average. Um, you know, again, play a couple of times a week at my club. I want to improve my driving. Um, it might not necessarily be technique as such that's the issue. Is there any sort of advice that you could give that person to help them take yeah. their long game to, or driving to the next level? So I'll, technically, uh, aside, I would just set up a drill. I set up a drill at, at the range and I'll have 10 balls and I'll have uh, just a simple target of fairway and just literally how many balls can I hit in that fairway target? Probably I'd start with sort of 30 yards wide. 30, 40 yards wide. That's the general gist of things. And when you can start to get towards more, you know, 70, 80%, then you move your targets in. Yeah. So you move, your, you move your, your target into maybe 30 yards, 35 yards. Use the poles on the back of the driving ranges or use two flags and be harsh on yourself. Say, you know what? That was cutting into the right-hand side of it. It wasn't going to be on the fairway. It was going to miss the fairway. It was going to spin off. Or that was hooking down the left-hand side. It pitched in between, but it was definitely going in the rough. Mm. And then you can sort of start to, as you get better and you achieve more 7 out of 10, 8 out of 10, you can also do it with 3 wood as well. Then go to 20 balls and then go, right, this session is, you know, strict. My full routine, 20 balls down that fairway. I want to achieve, you know, 70 to 80% of the fairways hit. Because if you look at the guys, you know, you might even need to start at 50 yards wide for you club golfers because that's generally that might be semi and a bit of rough as well but at least it gives you a parameter to start with it gives you a benchmark of how am I going to progress as a player and how am I going to get better at performing and then when you get on the golf course when you start to move it in and in and in you start to think well actually it's, it's easier to hit these fairways now yeah Absolutely. And I think it gives you a bit of structure in your sessions it gives you it'll give the players something to actually go to the driving range and do even if it's five balls and you do one with your drive, one with your three wood, it's much better than just hitting five balls. Sometimes you don't. Yeah. It'll, be the best, it'll be the best five, ten minutes of a session you'll do because you'll actually be switched on to a target. You'll be switched on, you'll be engaged to hitting fairways. I was going to say, I think that's something you see a lot as well, and I think Joe will certainly agree with this. I mean, you've got a, a nice driving range where you could actually stand and, and watch people doing it, mm -hmm. but... You know, you've, you often see people down there, they're hitting balls, they just hit driver after driver, they're not really paying attention to necessarily where it goes, they're looking at the curvature on it and that's it, or the distance. Yeah. Whereas to actually kind of imagine that you're on a golf course, I think it's really beneficial. I mean, something that I've done before in lessons, if somebody really struggles with a particular hole or tee shot, if I'd at four, I've booked them in, you know, six o'clock in the evening, we go down to that hole, I've got a practice bag full of balls and we go, right, let's stand and let's hit this tee shot. And yeah. let's work on the technique and things on this halt. See, they get used to being on that tee. Because if you turn yeah. it into a comfort zone for an, you know, an amateur golfer, that's mm -hmm. huge. And suddenly they stand there and they're like, oh, I can suddenly see this shape and this technique yeah. helps me hit that shape. Well, that then applies to other holes they find easier. And actually yeah, then it was, yeah we, all have, we all have holes that sort of, like say sometimes you stand on it, you go, I just don't see the tee shot. No. You know, I, I don't. I don't like that. And, and club golfers, because they're constantly playing the same golf course, that's when people start to go, well, I can't get it off that tee box. I really, you know, I've really got problems with that tee. And you think, you haven't got problems with the tee box. It's the shot. 
you don't like the shot, your bad shot is going to get punished in this scenario. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to take that away. It's not the hole that you don't like, it's your miss that you don't like. And on mm. this hole, it's going to get punished. So you've got to find a way to manage yourself, whether it's moving your ball position, moving the club face, something to manage that one shot. Because all you need is a couple of good tee shots on that hole and it's gone. It's exactly. not a... It's not an actual, you just constantly do the same thing and expect different results. If you do something different, you will get a different result out of it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that's, that's actually a trap I fell into. I didn't play much away golf when I was, when I was a junior. And you, yeah. you step up on the tee. And when I started to take it a little bit more seriously, and I, I had a little pop at playing full time, which didn't last too long. I ran out of money. But... Um, uh, basically what my coach would always say always 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 because i'm playing most of my golf in practice at that one golf course i'd step up on a tee and i wouldn't give it a second thought ah oh, well i always hit four iron off it so i pull four iron up and yeah. i'd walk up onto the tee and, and the best example is um on some tees you know where if you carry on your bag you plonk your bag and walk back to the tee and you you don't give the the hole a, a second thought. You just whack that club out your bag because that's yeah, of course you you made you made the decision before you even know what what you, exactly. know, you might get back to the tee and go actually not I've I've hit driver great the first five holes I'm gonna pop at this yeah oh but I've got four in my hand you make a decision based on something you've always done you know it's it's clockwork isn't it you just constantly yeah. doing the same thing when you play your home golf club yeah yeah so so I'd encourage anyone listening to this. Uh, it was a trap I fell into through basically naivety, naivety and I was young. Uh, mm. And you just whack a club out the bag, hit the shot and go and play a game. But actually, when you're going away and playing golf courses that maybe you haven't either haven't played at all or haven't played much, you would have to think about it and think, OK, where's my where's my position? Hey, where's where if I'm yeah. not driving it particularly well, where, where do I need to hit it? What I'd encourage people to do that play at the same sort of golf course every time is mix it up mix it up find what works best for you find because i mean no day's the same is it when no you definitely switch, not i mean older i always i always find practicing the shots before i actually go out and play most club golfers don't hit balls before they play but when i'll go and hit balls to warm up i'll hit different shots i'll not just hit constant shots so i'll move my ball position a little bit back for the draw neutral with my where i want it to be straight and a little bit forward for a cut and then Almost when I get onto the golf course, I'll continue to do that. So if I know that left's dead, let's say, I want to start the ball further right. So I move the ball further back and try and hit my draw. So I've eliminated one side that I don't want to hit it. And yeah. then vice versa, if I don't want to hit it right, I'll move the ball position a little bit further forward so I can square the club face up and it starts a bit yeah. further left. I've, I've, I've practiced the shots on the range and then I've put myself in a scenario on the golf course where... You know, I, I know where the punishment is, and I'm going to play the shot that I need to play. Yeah. Whereas I think mm. most club golfers don't. They'll they'll just walk onto the tee and go, "Well, I'll just I always hit four right here, so I'll just hit four right." Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's re really interesting. So it's it's totally a mindset thing. You've got to know your limitations as a golfer. Yeah. Obviously, at your level, Nick, you're well elite, uh, mm. but for your 18 handicaps. There is absolutely scope to to change it up, try different shots, and definitely be more aggressive. Definitely be more yeah, aggressive. Yeah, definitely. I think you enjoy your golf a little bit more as well. Yeah. I mean, for your 18 handicappers, you're there for enjoyment. You you want to enjoy your golf. You want to play your best rounds. You you want a social as well. But to play shots that you know that you never try to play on the driving range is great because then you go out onto the golf course with the confidence to try them again. Yeah. Yeah without going onto yeah. the golf course going, well, I've never actually tried this golf shot. Or, you know, last time I played, I didn't hit any, hardly any fairways. And then I went to the driving range, I hit 10 balls, I hit five out of 10 fairways. That's a lot better. I knew on the golf course now, I can hit five out of 10 fairways easily. Yeah. They, they yeah. know that then. You've got confidence to back it up to go on the golf course, rather than going straight back to the golf course going, oh God, I didn't hit any fairways last time I played. You've actually practiced something that you needed to get better yeah. rather than just going and hitting balls absolutely no i agree with that well we better wrap it up there that's that's um that's a pretty well a very insightful uh clip for for the channel which hopefully everybody enjoys uh just to just to sign out because this is the this is the last time well the last couple of last couple of words from nick 
what's your what's your plans what's your schedule for everyone to look out for yeah so uh, schedule's obviously looking a little bit looks a bit blank at the moment not sure when Europro will get going again uh i'll be playing every 2020 tour event i can play uh, right. which is chris anderson's tour be playing a little bit of the 1836 as i imagine they will get going as soon as sort of yeah. we get out of lockdown uh Jimmy Guitar will start to get going again. Uh, I'm not quite sure on the Euro Pro when that will get back going again or if we'll get a chance to go to tour school at the end of the year. Yeah. It's obviously a very tough year for the tour and uh, anyone in, who's playing for a living, it's it's all up in arms. But yeah. anything I can sort of play and I'll be competing as soon as, uh, Super. As soon as it lets get out, really. Well, um, well, everybody look out for Nick's name. Nick Popperton um, will be, we'll be watching you and backing you all the way. So good luck yeah, with yeah. when you get back to normal. Thanks for everybody yeah. for tuning in. Uh, Lovery, pleasure as always. Nick, always. Pleasure. Uh, well, Cheers. you're welcome back on when, when you get that um, Tour Championships win and your card for the challenge. You let us know and we'll get you Cheers. on. We'll get you yeah. on the pod again. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Brilliant. All right. uh, like and subscribe, everybody. We will see you all very soon. Thanks very much. <laughs>